Welcome, everyone. I uh, really appreciate you joining us here today. My name is Joshua Sullivan. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at, at Arliss. And uh, I want to also thank uh, both uh, our, our, our sponsor here, uh, Microsoft, and hosting this event. And uh, looking forward to, to a, a, a fantastic conversation today here on, on really getting on some of the nuances here of IT and OT, information technology and operational technology for the defense industrial base and more broadly, the, defense, uh, Depart the Department of Defense here uh, for how we build out cyber defense, okay? So uh, challenge today, defending commercial industry and defense industrial base from that IT, OT perspective underpins the challenges we have across the readiness kill, cha kill chains in joint fight. And uh, I'm sure some are paying attention here to the Cyber Security Maturity Model Certification, CMMC, as that's coming online here in the defense industrial base, and as it parallels inside the Department of Defense in improving our cybersecurity and also our, our cyber defense capabilities, building out those internal requirements and uh, resilient supply chain necessary to support it. So uh, today we're, we're, we're going to discuss the critical components of that, what, what makes a mature cyber defense program from cradle to grave of DoD systems. Uh, I'm sure we're all aware that most DoD warfighting capabilities are born and die in the dip. So our intent here today is, is to explore you know, the current art and science of, of cyber defense when it comes to IT and OT. So we're going to talk a little bit more broadly than just cybersecurity and compliance and making sure that we have good policies and, and, and good methodologies in terms of vulnerability management and talking more broadly about how do we effectively conduct cyber warfare and cyber defense. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome our two guests today, uh, Mr. Chris Cleary, Department of Navy Principal Cyber Advisor. Uh, he is the, the the first Principal Cyber Advisor for the Department of the Navy, and uh, you know is, is trailblazing the way here when it comes to cyber defense. I'd also like to welcome uh, Joe Di Di Pietro here to uh, the, the program, Microsoft IoT Security, uh, global uh, leader of uh, Black Belt for IoT Security. Now I'm sure. Uh, some folks are familiar with what the principal cyber advisor is, so I'm going to talk real briefly about, about what that is, and, and so we're all on the same page. It, it's a new position uh, authorized here with the National Defense Authorization Act of, for 2020, so uh, created the end of last, uh, last calendar year, and it's a three-star equivalent uh, position and has a significant amount of responsibilities, uh, particularly for implementing the DOD cyber strategy within the Department of Defense. Uh, coordinating and overseeing the execution of, of, of Department of Navy's policies and programs rel rel relevant to, to some of the following here. So uh, recruitment, resourcing, training of military cyber operations forces, assessment of those forces, readiness metrics, maintenance of those forces, standardization and readiness levels, acquisition of offense and defense, uh, Navy DOD and cyber capabilities uh, and uh, for conduct across military cyberspace operations. Uh, cybersecurity maturity uh, management and operations, acquisition of, of cybersecurity tools and capabilities, cybersecurity and related supply chain risk management in the industrial base, cybersecurity of DoD information systems, information technology services, weapon systems, and, and, and a whole lot of uh, acquisition from stem to stern in terms of testing and acquiring and, and mitigating and managing those risks across not only the Navy's enterprise, but also their, their vast uh, weapon capabilities. And finally, not least, evaluating, improving, and enforcing a culture of cybersecurity warfighting and accountability for cybersecurity and cyberspace operations. So really excited to talk through some of those roles and what that means when we start talking about IT and OT. Uh, Navy has a more descriptive term of platform information technology PIT. So those are somewhat interchangeable. And, and then Joe, uh, brings more than 25 years of leadership and hands-on experience with enterprise security leaders, including Microsoft, CyberX, IBM, Guardium, Checkpoint Software. And as I said, he leads the global black belt team for IoT security. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Glad to be here. So, uh, you know, th that's an awful lot there. Uh, you know, and we've been talking about this for a little while, right? So, the, I, you know, I, I always like to point back at the Defense Science Board study back here in 2013 where we, we first got to be able to kind of publicly talk about some of these challenges, right? They had a task force report uh, talking about resilient military systems and advanced cyber threat. 
Uh, in it, they hit, I think, on a couple of key points that seem to become the foundation of most of our conversations these days. So one, uh, U.S. comprehensive dependence on technology is going to be a magnet for opponents. So it's, this problem's not going away. Uh, there are no technical approaches that will comprehensively protect UAD against a determined adversary. So if, if you're dealing with a adversary that, that has time, that has resources, has the mission, and uh, you know has the the overall set of co capabilities and capacity, they're they're probably going to get in. So how do we manage that? Third. Uh, you know, from a practitioner standpoint, there are many tests that we can use to, to discover and demonstrate the vulnerability or weakness of a system. But there's, there's never going to be a test that demonstrates and proves the, the, the security of a system, especially as we're talking about all those different adversaries that, that may be attacking that infrastructure. And then fourth and finally there, adversaries get a vote. So, as, as, you know, in the end of the day, once we've figured all this out, uh, things might change rapidly. Uh, so this 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 problem space is a is a challenge space that that seems to span the globe, seems to span uh, almost every single bit of technology we use in in our warfighting platforms, and uh, you know sounds like a a, a whole lot of of uh, work to be done here to to I think get that culture straight. Uh, Mr. Clare, you want to you want to talk briefly about some of the the intro we just ran through. Yeah, absolutely. And again, Josh, thanks for having me, Joe. It's always a pleasure to see you. Um, so for the Navy, right, as, as the Department of the Navy has, has come to the conclusion of, of not a conclusion, but what we're going to do about cybersecurity and cyberspace operations, um, there is sort of a line of demarcation that exists between um, the chief information officer and what he does to create the information environment, which, you know, point joint pub. And for those of you listening on the on the I, I come from a pretty uh, died in the wool military background, um, you know, and in Joint Club 312, the information environment created by the chief information officer is what all cyberspace operations are contained within. So there's a symbiotic relationship that exists between the, 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 the organizations responsible for sort of acquiring um, and deploying all of this thing we call the information environment. And then in the military, you introduce sort of the uniform wearing guys are the ones responsible for you know, operating, defending, fighting in, with, and through this environment that's created by the chief information officer. And then there's a whole bunch of ones and zero dogs and cats that live off there, you know, myriad of special access programs. And for those of you in the space, you know, you kind of know what I'm talking about. But when we go to define cyberspace activities and cyberspace operations, at least the, well, we're, we're, we're kind of beginning to bucket it into four fundamental groups that the principal cyber advisor is responsible for. Uh, cybersecurity, which has its own definitions, is the brackish water to which sort of the CIO organization and the, this warfighting organization sort of live within. So there's a very shared responsibility between there. As you start moving away from cybersecurity and getting into things like cyber resilience, and for the, for the Department of the Navy, we begin to find cyber resilience as weapon systems and critical infrastructure, not your traditional information environment kind of things, but things that absolutely have cybersecurity vulnerabilities uh, uh, aligned to them, again, just not traditional IT the way we think through it. And then as you start continuing further down that continuum, you eventually get into cyberspace capabilities, you know, offensive cyber tools, defensive cyber tools, uh, the creation and recruiting and training and deployment of the cyber workforce, both uniformed and non-uniformed, think the National Mission Force and the component uh, the 40 teams that the Navy presents to that mission force that goes to your cybercom. And then you ultimately have the cyber operations, you know, all the things that a combination of, of technology and people and organizations and processes go off to do to conduct cyberspace operations. Um, Josh laid out very, very kind of clearly what some of the problem statements are. And I'm actually glad that he said it the way he did because he comes from a lot of the same environments that I come from. So we already are kind of inclined to speak the same language, which is, I think like, if you look at the NIST framework as an example, and I like to say that if we use that and we compare it to traditional engineering practices, you know, when we built buildings 100 years ago that fell over when the wind blew too strong or just arbitrarily caught on fire, somebody said, well, this isn't right. We need to have standards so these things just don't arbitrarily happen. But we still acknowledge that somebody could drop a bomb on it, which would really mitigate the fact that it was built structurally, you know, correctly. 
it just won't arbitrarily, it just won't spontaneously catch on fire. But if I put a JDAM in it, it's going to catch on fire. And I think we have to kind of look at the militarization of cyberspace in a similar way. I need to build systems that are resilient. They shouldn't just arbitrarily break. There shouldn't be big gaping holes in them. They're all the things we should do in best practices should always be there. We should always be striving for this information environment or operational technology, acknowledging that it's a complicated, sophisticated world and people don't uh, knowingly or wittingly or uh, uh, neglectfully build vulnerabilities into our systems, right? There's some unknown unknowns. But we also have to acknowledge that our adversary is sophisticated, our adversaries are well-resourced, our adversaries are determined, and we're never going to build the perfect mousetrap. Um, we build our warships with, uh, with the, the idea that an adversary is going to try it one day, try to sink this or set it on fire. And there's systems we can put in place to help mitigate those things. You know, point defense systems that are you shoot down a missile if it's coming in there, redundant damage control systems. But the adversary still gets a vote. And even though we might do all of those things and the crew performs marvelously and all the things worked as designed, that ship could still go to the bottom of the ocean. It's just the nature of warfare. So when we talk about the culture of war fighting, a lot of that has to sort of be brought into the information environment saying, guys, we could build the perfect mousetrap, but we still have sophisticated adversaries who are going to pick at it. Um, and now that we've accepted from the information environment, sort of cybersecurity now is table stakes and all the things we're going to do on traditional IT systems, which is good. There's been a run to that door. There's lots of capability. There's lots of new technology we've built in every day. There's companies like Microsoft that are leading the way in some of these things to continue. They're putting out uh, secure software. Well, now we're beginning to spill over into the industrial control systems and operational technology, which didn't always necessarily have security in mind with that. And I think this is this next explosion in culture you're going to see with um, the emphasis on making sure these, this whole new uh, series and, and phylum of kind of tools and capabilities we're going to be leveraging have similar uh, security measures built into them kind of out of the gate. Uh, and, you know, with that, I'm looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you, sir. So, Joe, uh, you know, we, we are in, living in an interesting world right now, waves of digital transformation. A lot of what used to be manual processes are becoming more and more automated. We're, we're finding more and more digitization, not just of, of uh, you know, knowledge working, but also first line work and now also uh, showing up directly in operational technology. So, uh, you know, we used to have industrial control systems and, and SCADA and, and lots of other capabilities that have been there for a little while, making sure that the you know, the power's working, the water's running. So in industry, though, you know, we design spec wise, we built for a high level of availability. Right. So so in terms of building insurance out and whatnot, uh, how does how does that and that perspective of robust engineering in terms of guaranteeing that that level of assurance match up then with how w what we understand with security in terms of the vulnerabilities and, and building out that infrastructure? Yeah, so great question, and thanks for having me on board. Um, part of what I think we have to understand is that industry has been evolving, right? So you look at we're in industry 4.0, if you will, where there's a lot of digitalization. But we can't forget industry 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0 that is still essentially powering our national grid, if you will. And so there's a lot of older legacy equipment where you can't put good security controls on top of them. Um, they were built for a specific function. And in order to do what their manufacturing operations is or to generate electricity, um, that's their sole purpose. And these were built decades ago. So you didn't really have the forethought of all of the cyber um, attacks and capabilities that we have today that was um, built in when they were originally designed. So the length of time that the operational technology equipment is in the field is really one element that is really a challenge for us. You look at some of the ships that are still, you know, floating around and protecting our shores. Um, those all have different um, capabilities, but their uh, cybersecurity wasn't part of the forethought when they were designed originally. So I think this is starting to change. There's a couple of terms, one we'll call it greenfield, where if there's new IoT type devices or OT or SCADA devices where you can put security controls on that particular uh, IoT sensor, then we're able to do that. 
but there's a lot of brownfield, which essentially means you can't put any security agents on there. So you need a different level of compensating control to identify if there's vulnerabilities or how you protect against that. You know, there's recent studies that says, um, you know, attackers are probably in the environment for well over 200 days before we're actually identifying what they're doing. So our job is to be able to identify and assume like zero trust that the attackers do get into the environment. So we need to set the alarm so that they're tripped early in the cycle before they can do material damage. So apologize for the long-winded answer, but hopefully there's a couple of pieces uh, that make sense in there. No, I, I thought that was uh, spot on, Joe. And, 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 you know, as you're talking through Greenfield and Brownfield, you know, that, that reminds me, you know, in terms of building out ships and as we deal with building out capabilities for the fleet, uh, you know, the, there was always this concept that we really have three different fleets at a given time, right? We have the, the fleet that is, that is uh, out and deployed and operating. We have the fleet that we're in the middle of, of fielding our, our capabilities that are funded this fiscal year. And, and then we get the fleet on the drawing board. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I can't help but wonder of, of, you know, if we look at the fleet that, that's out there today and, you know, apply that brown, brownfield mentality to it, as well as even the one that we're just trying to you know, feel the capabilities we've got right now, right? Well, there's a lot of technical debt out there. We've, we've bought a lot of, I think, infrastructure and capabilities, but not necessarily the people in the process to do it. Um, you know, Chris, what are, what are some ways there of, uh, uh, you know, how, how do we get ahead of this? How do we get past that, that technical debt, let alone get it at, at the censoring that, that Joe's talking about? Yeah, and actually, you know, um, so uh, Vice Admiral Tressler, who's the N2N6, comes from a, a submariner's background, and he actually has a really unique perspective on this, which, to be honest with you, there's something to be said for uh, uh, individuals that come into this space that didn't necessarily grow up in the, the information technology space. Um, Admiral Trussler makes a really, really good point. You talk about, you know, we identify vulnerabilities in, criti- in, in operational technology systems, industrial control systems in our ships. But what's unique about our ships is each ship, although you'll take like the Arleigh Burke class destroyer as an example, there's really no two Arleigh Burke class destroyers that are exactly alike, right? They all have unique differences. They've all been to the yards at different times. They've all got, you know, one variant of a piece of equipment on or not, or a, a different Aegis build. So the good news, if there is good news to the story, is that you know one vulnerability that you might discover in a piece of operational technology that's relevant to the the, the Arleigh class destroyer might not really be relevant to the entire class, right? Of the seventy some odd hulls in the Navy, yeah, you found a vulnerability, but you might not be able to peanut butter spread that across every ship because they're all a little uniquely different from each other. So that's a good thing mm. uh, from uh, being able to deliver an effect against a whole category of weapon system within the Navy. That probably is not as achievable as we might want to think it to be. Now, the negative to that is you have 70 ships out there that are all a little different from each other to one degree or another. So when you're looking at trying to introduce, you know, or refitting or backfitting, um, you've got all sorts of different variants that require different levels of maintenance at different times. Now, you talk about the ship of the future, right? Of course, it is more cost effective to know that you build a platform and all these platforms look exactly alike. And now you are, there is more standardization which would then would be a concern, right? If every single ship in a class is exactly the same and I've identified a vulnerability in some piece of equipment that I can target, well, now maybe I will be able to actually affect an entire class of weapon system um, based on something that, to, to, uh, to Joe's point, uh, it might be some you know, controller somewhere that was built 40 years ago that A, doesn't have a password on it, so now you're right, how do I monitor these? Or we always make the running jokes about the ones that did have passwords 20 years ago. The password is password. It's hard set in, and it's going to be like that until you actually remove it. You don't. So there's not an administrator that can reach into it and change it remotely or change the password every 90 days. It's just it's not possible to do those things. Um, so I think it's an interesting, you know, to your point. How do we get ahead of it? Well, obviously, as we introduce new capability to the fleet, we're trying to build the culture of ensuring that that all these these cyber, you know, I'll just grossly call them cyber vulnerabilities, are addressed as early as possible in the design cycle. So it's not something we're trying to back and fit. And that's that's really the culture that we're trying to say is that 
now that we understand there are means and methods to affect these things remotely, well, now you have to address that on the drawing board before it even goes to be built or integrated in some other larger weapon system. Um, and, and that's the, so, so from ASNR DNA, uh, they are taking a really hard look at how they push security as far to the left in a development cycle as possible. So they don't have to deal with it, you know, post commissioning of some platform. Wow. So that sounds like a lot of work to be done. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. as I think through that, right, there's, there's because what, a, what a, like an Arlen Burke destroy, we're, we're talking probably three of the different syscoms probably touch it, a handful of PEOs, uh, you know, probably 60, 70 different program offices. Uh, you know, I, I recall the, the, the trials and tribulations of Keynes, right, and how, how, how some of the challenges there of, of virtualizing infrastructure. And that was really focused on the command control systems, right? And the, the IT infrastructure, uh, not so much the OT. And there's been some consolidation there as well. Um, you know, Joey, we, we were talking through, you know, modeling and simulation and censoring. I, you know, I've been amazed at, at, at where uh, industry has been moving out here. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, there, there, was a, there was a Microsoft presentation a little while ago about a, a a uh, soap factory, right? And they're able to link it up to a digital twin. And through that digital twin, they were able to, to uh, you know, this thing pops out, I think like 10,000 bars of soap a minute. And so any- We want any, a clean world, Josh. So right, yeah, definitely right. you know, so, so, you know, any, any ways of improving on that was, was pretty big, right? And, 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 you know, part of that was, 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 was censoring and, 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 you know, going through and building out those models you know, Navy's doing a lot with with, with model based systems engineering. How, how does that plug into to uh, no kidding being able to censor those systems? We all make sense out of it. Yeah. So you know, when you build a system, right, there's a ton of different components, and what you're seeing now with Industry 4.0 is the digitization and the ability to put sensors on small sub pieces of the overall um, larger system. Um, and if we look back in time, the amount of data that's generated now, because we can connect up a tremendous amount of sensors, in the example you used about building a digital twin, all of that stuff is cloud connected, it's scalable, there's a lot of uh, capacity uh, involved in that. And so uh, with this, the key points from a security perspective is to be able to identify what are the critical points of the overall system so that we can have good security controls and validate that these controls are actually working. Um, part of the best practices in security is to be able to monitor a system, but not let it be known, if you will. So if it gets compromised, the attackers don't know where the security logs are so that they can delete them. And then you can have a little bit of obscurity in that, but your cyber operations systems can see exactly what the attacker is doing as they trip different sensors in the overall system. Um, so we're trying to build a lot of this stuff in up front, and as you say, shift left, right? And the more newer stuff, we're able to do that, but we still have to retrofit because we do have legacy equipment that's still going to be around, you know, for at least another decade or so as well. Yeah, it reminds me of my, my, old, my old school days there, you get what you inspect, not what you expect. So, <laughs> so how, we, how we, we build out that high ground there to be able to, to inspect, right, versus just expect. Um, you know, and, uh, Chris, I think you were talking through uh, known, known vulnerabilities. You know, so those, those vulnerabilities we know about, that, that they're, they maybe have a CVE associated with them. Maybe if we're lucky, the, the vendor is working on a patch. Maybe we have a patch available. And maybe somehow we can now apply that to a, a 25-year-old generator or, 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 or pump or, or what have you. Um, you know, but I can't help but think that that it's the threat that goes after the vulnerability, not the vulnerability that goes after the threat. So, uh, you know, how there's a whole lot of vulnerabilities out there that we know about. There are probably even more we don't know about. How, is there some ways to integrate maybe threat intelligence in here to, to, to get ahead of this problem? Yeah, and, and I think we're, and I'm going to get the formula wrong, but we, I've seen it a million times in, you know, CISO schools. It's, uh, you know, vulnerability times risk equals threat or, you know, some combination in there, right? You know, there's lots of vulnerabilities that you may have discovered that through uh, 
Um, the adversary is just not interested. There's no indication that the adversary is interested in going after this. So is it really a is it really a threat or risk? Risk equals threat times vulnerability, right? So there might be no risk there because there's no there's no demonstrated threat. Well, that's hard to prove that, and it's hard to know what the adversary is or isn't looking at. But some of the things that we that we do have a that we should be able to get around is this construct of access. You know, um, there's some friends of mine that work over in the Naval Cyber Warfare Development Group, and they would say things like they use an acronym called ACME. You know, so <laughs> access, capability, maneuver, effect. Right, you need all four of those things to exist to be able to do something. And I may have developed um, a capability that if I have physical access to the device, I could do all the above, but I may not just have access to the piece. So some of these industrial control systems that live on, you know, deployed vessels, you know, access is something that an adversary is going to have to work pretty hard to gain. So maybe we can tone down some of the concerns we'd have on a vulnerability I might find on a, on a gas turbine generator, again, on a Burke, right? But mm -hmm. That gas turbine generator might be providing power on a shore facility that has the access problem is completely different. Or let's just say there might not be an access problem. Access might be something relatively trivial for an adversary uh, to gain. So then so then that is a concern. Um, <laughs> but I, one of the things that, that, that we've been trying to bring to not only the, 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 the CIO organizations and the ASNR DNA, you know, the acquisition and the CIO worlds is this threat component to it um and look at the, the the people in the pentagon the people in the you know everybody is busy right it's hard to keep your head around everything that's going on and then you want to add adversary activity on top of it challenging to say the least right i mean you got people only have so many hours in the day um so we're making an effort to try and make it easier to consume threat information at different levels different classification levels different um, you know, whether different capabilities, different adversaries, right? So, you know, it's kind of obvious uh, as the as the geographic commanders sort of divvy up their lanes in the road, you know, it's it's not a far leap to know that the uh, Indo-PACOM theater of operation is mostly a uh, China problem. So the Navy spends quite a bit of Navy and Marine Corps spends quite a bit of time thinking through, you know, our peer competitors uh, in the Indo-PACOM region where the Air Force and the Army are a little bit more you know, let's say Russia focused just because geographically it's more in their backyard. Um, so, uh, yeah, we need to do a lot more to integrate with you. And then, but, you know, but on that same note, not everything can is, can be a super uber secret all the time. Right. Super secrets that only those with TSSCI clearances are aware of don't really help everybody else. So we've got to figure out sort of this information sharing part and I think you can still give information with with protecting sources and methods, which is really what intelligence is all about. Um, but some of the the, the information uh, derived through our you know very sophisticated collection activities, we have to figure out a way to get that to the people where it makes a difference without necessarily you know compromising sources and methods. Whole different conversation, uh, but things that we're still we are trying to figure out. Wow! So so it sounds like there's a lot. A lot there, and it's, and it's not just about uh, the one ship. It's really about the, the 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 fleet of ships and how we're understanding the vulnerabilities and the threats, and, and really information sharing across all those different groups. Um, you know, Chris, I I, I can't help but think, uh, you know, and, and and recall some of the, you know, as as we're working through these things. Um, You know, from from a from a you know, as we we talked about just the the promulgation of that information. I, I, I'm I'm thinking of the uh, uh, you know what, what unfortunately Solar Winds had experience here with with the Orion platform and those exploitations, and you know how how some challenges there could have an outside effect on their supply chain, and um, you know the the means of detection there. Right. You know, Joe, I, I know that Microsoft was heavily involved there. There's probably some things you can and can't get into, uh, you know, but, you know, I, I, I'm thinking through some things that, you know, FireEye was talking about in terms of, of their capabilities that Microsoft recognized them for, for really kind of, I think, opening our eyes to the, the whole, to what was going on there. Uh, you know, this, uh, I think they referred to as UNC 2452, and they, they created new, new, new TTPs, behaviors we'd never seen before. 
uh, maneuvers we've never seen before. They, they tailor-made exploits and, and malware for specific targets. And, um, you know, Microsoft has this this graph, right, this this collection of information across. And, and as you're putting these sensors out there, yeah. how, how does that work? Is there a way that, that we can use those sensors, uh, one, to detect locally, but then also m- more regionally or globally? How does that come together? Yeah, so a great uh, comment. Um, part of what we're trying to do is be able to identify um, all the local issues that you see, but then also propagate that up to central resources. Um, Microsoft Graph is an open uh, system, so other people can tap into all of the signals that we get. You can think about the the billions of emails that we see, um, the uh, endpoints that we're talking to, the Bing searches that we validate that are um, um, normal and, and ones that have threats associated with them. And so you try to get that uh, collectively, but then we also have threat uh, intel and research teams. And this is, you know, common, you know, there are certain companies that have these and great companies, um, right? But you want to have the threat intel so that you can share, have knowledge sharing between the different organizations. And it's a matter of how you start to automate that sharing. When you see one um, bad actor or malicious activity, you want to be able to propagate that very quickly in an automated fashion. So there's a lot of other different types of systems, SOAR type systems, security orchestration response type systems, to help automate and facilitate the quick responses to this. Once you see a signal in one area of the world or one geography or one known threat technology. So this will help us at least try to get ahead of the game and um, prevent it in one area, but then spread it out so that if some other customers see it, they're able to be automatically uh, protected against it. Hmm. So even though a number of those sensors are passive in nature, it sounds like they still kind of feed up in terms of of providing a good sense of situation awareness, as well as a sense of where we are from a performance perspective, a vulnerability perspective, and even a threat perspective. Yeah, and you can um, implement these sensors totally uh, on premise or on chip, if you will, decoupled from um, a cloud connection or things like that. And then, you know, connect them up after when they come on board for maintenance and things like that, collect the data. So there's a number of different ways and technologies to implement, but as Chris will tell you, you need to implement this in the appropriate time when the ships are at their appropriate station in their active duties. Hmm. That sounds like a lot of work. So you mentioned a couple of different, different groups there doing that work. And, and, you know, it's always interesting uh, you know, as working with the defense industrial base, some of these organizations are really small, like, you know, one, one, 10 person shop that, that's super smart on, uh, you know, submarine warfare, but that doesn't know anything about IT, let alone security, let alone the, the devices they're building should have some security components built in. What, what are the right groups there? What, you know, culture, I think, was was kind of how we started this conversation of, of you know, we've got to figure that out. What, what are some of those different groups going on there, Joe? And, and how do those how do those come together there on the Microsoft side? And maybe that can, how, how can that apply in the Navy? I guess the next question. Yeah. So if we take a look back at culture, and I've been in the security industry for a bit, but one of my first uh, jobs was with the company that developed Ethernet over Twisted Pair, and we did great huh. building in the network, started to get them all connected, and then I went to a firewall company, and then you saw this culture clash between the networking team and the security team try to take over. And they found their happy medium. After that, then I went to another company that did database security. So imagine trying to talk to the SAP administrator about security, where all they want to do is make sure that it's operationally up and running and active and available so that you can produce your reports. So security in that culture, you know, shifted a little bit as well. And then as we talk about operational technology, the plant people, they just want to make sure that these systems run, they're available. Um, security is not necessarily in the forefront. And this is, again, one of those culture shifts. One of our clients, in order to try to help with you know, how to make an impact culturally, they took one of the plant engineers and put them in the sock for a little bit. They took the sock and had them walk around the plant. That way you get an appreciation of what the other role is uh, responsible for. So this is part of the awareness training that I think is going to be needed in order to get an appreciation for all the different aspects, especially as cyber comes into play. And then specifically, there's a couple of different research teams inside of Microsoft. Mystic does a fantastic job. And then I'm going to give some kudos to our Section 52, which is strictly responsible for looking for OT and IoT threats. 
They recently discovered some, um, bad, it's called um, mal, bad, bad alloc, forgive me, um, bad alloc <laughs> when you uh, allocate memory for IoT devices. And essentially, this um, you know vulnerability is exposed in a lot of different vendors' equipment. But we're trying to um, expose that so that we can put in good controls around it. Right. And all of the different research teams have to work together in order to build products that will help our customers protect their environment. And that's kind of where we're um, the forefront of what we're trying to do. Hmm. So a lot of different folks. And, 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 and you know, it, the thing that drives me nuts with cyber is, is how much we interchange some of the, those roles and orientations. You know, so it sounds like there's there are groups that are focused at making sure the the, the system works and that we have, you know, a high degree of availability and, and, and you know, the, the mission is successful on that. Uh, you know, it sounds like we have groups of, of, you know, making sure the engineering perspective that the infrastructure is supported and maintained. And, and then there's another group that probably is better saying about threat and they're, they're trying to work through how to counter threat. And, and so, you know, how we get all those different groups working together. Uh, you know, Chris, the, you know, Navy, I think, has been all over the journey here the last couple of years, right? Uh, you know, as, and, and it's probably a little bit demonstrated from from a from moving from a, a CISO role now to a principal cyber advisor role, having more uh, probably broad ownership on not just uh, our IT and maybe some of our C4ISR systems, but now more broadly across. And you know, what what's what's the right workforce here? What's the right culture? Just you know, how do we how do we deter, detect, engage? Some of the these high end adversaries, some of these low end adversaries. Yeah, I, that's a great question, and we're and we're struggling with that, right? And I'm a, I, I just want to reference back to some of the things that Joe said a minute ago. You know, I I remember when I started in my own security career at the Office of Naval Intelligence in 2001, and went to one of my first Black Hat conferences. We used to make the joke that Microsoft had a had a booth there in this in the vendor hall. And we're like, hey we wouldn't be having this conference if it wasn't for Microsoft, right? I mean, they're the, in the day, they were the ones that, you know, Microsoft in two decades has taken a, a ridiculously round, a round turn is a good term in the Navy on security and the way that it's incorporated into Microsoft products moving forward. So, so you know, tip of the hat to Microsoft for taking you know security so seriously over the last couple of decades. But when you get into this, what is this right mix, right? We, um, you know, IT information technology is dual, dual use, right? Operating system, Microsoft, you find it all over the place. It's not just unique to information uh, or traditional business systems. It's we, we find it everywhere, right? Um, so it's it's the, the, the culture has to extend beyond what the services can do for themselves and the things they have to work with industry to be supported on, right? You know, we the, the Department of Defense, love it or hate it, is a Microsoft shop. We have a ridiculous dependency on Microsoft. We saw it during COVID uh, when Microsoft made some really, uh, uh, you know, uh, business decisions to ensure the Department of Defense was up and running with help us stand up our CBR environment, right? So there's just, so culturally, the symbiotic relationship that it's just not a, you know, customer, a service provider sort of, you know, very cold, you you have a, you have money, I'll take it, I'll give you a product or a service. There was a partnership that existed there to ensure that we got through COVID um, if, you know, together, right? We, we had to survive. So when you talk about now building a workforce, this is where it's getting a little messy right now because Joe called it out very well. You know, there are security people, there are, you know, in the Navy, there are people that drive ships, there's information warfare types, there's pilots, there's submariners, there's civil engineers, there's, med you know, but we're finding that this that this information technology is something that's really binding us all together. You know, it is this has now become the common underground that everybody in one way, shape or form has a dependency on infra information technology. And it's only going to become more dependent. So uh, Lieutenant General Reynolds and I'll, I'll give a little bit of a C story here. Lieutenant General Reynolds, who's the deputy commandant of information on the Marine Corps side, she coined a phrase way back when that called everybody a, should be a cyber sentry. OK, well, then I came to the problem. and I said, well, what does that mean? Um, what are the things that a cyber sentry should be responsible for? And what it made me for is uh, a, a traditional sentry. And for those in the military, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, there's some general orders of the sentry that everybody had to memorize at a very early age. And they're a little bit different depending on service, but they're all fundamentally kind of the same things. Well, how did you. So we were in the process of creating these general orders for the cyber sentry, which is what is this? 
10 or 11 things that I don't care if you're a janitor, if you're an administrative clerk, if you're a nuclear engineer, if you're a pilot, if you're a mate, that everybody should have a baseline understanding of what information technology is and some level of accountability. You know, we always joke, it's the don't click on the link, right? Okay, well, <laughs> people do. And, you know, maybe the person that clicks on the link that introduces some, some, uh, some threat vector into your system is no different than the person going through the skiff door that holds it open, let somebody's tailgate in behind them, right? Well, okay, well, you, did, you, did you know who you just let into the building? Just because they were behind you doesn't mean they have access. You open the door, you know, so, so the, the, the analogies sort of play. Um, but to get people to embrace that everybody has an ability to introduce a vulnerability into the environments that they're working on is, is not, is hard because it's not easy for everybody to understand what exactly the capabilities of this thing are other than to take pictures, send text messages and talk to people. Well, this thing does a lot of other things as well. You should be responsible for all the different uh, uh, things and vulnerabilities that this could potentially introduce into your environment. Um, and, you know, at some point be held accountable for that. So that's where this cultural piece comes in here. And, and the, from a cyber standpoint, obviously, it's the, it's the CIO office and now the PCA that are going to try and drive uh, this accountability and ownership um, into the environment. But it, it's going to take time. Wow, sounds like a journey. And, um, you know, as, as we, we, we work through kind of that, that, that teaming arrangement there, and, you know, the, 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 the 11, 11 orders of the, the cyber century there, right, of, of, of the, the general orders, and, um, you know, it, it, it's interesting in terms of email, right? Because uh, you can craft an email so that eventually if you target it just right enough, the end user will always click, right? Now, alternatively, we can create feedback mechanisms in there. And so uh, you know, I've also seen where through a good training program, you can train the end users to report uh, a, 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 a email, a suspicious email, better than the any sensor. And so, as we talk through the, those those uh, you know orders of the century, there, how how do we create that feedback loop, right? Because you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, I, I remember uh, the, uh, young lieutenant. Uh, worked with here. He he he's talk about uh, you know cyber warfare is just like aviation warfare was right. Like you know we're kind of in the 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 nineteen twenties of of where air warfare was. You know just a decade or a, you know a century later here and um, you know the, the what was helpful to the, to aviation warfare was that if you did dumb things or if things didn't work. Unfortunately, it was an accident, right? Like it, it was, it was usually fairly attention getting. You know, unfortunately, sometimes catastrophic, right? And uh, so that that learning cycle, where with with this space, you know, a, a, a local defender that that cyber sentry can take can take risk to the whole system without knowing it. What what? How do we how do we give them feedback? How do we give them feedback? That that command feedback. You know, I, I know we we scan for vulnerabilities, right? ACAS is, is out there, but you know, even with operational technology, when we when we scan the system, we have a tendency sometimes even breaking the system just because of how it uses certain protocols. Uh, you know, so so Joe, I'd be curious uh, if you have thoughts there in terms of you know what are some of those feedback loops from a from a technology perspective, and as you worked with with, with you know broad swaths of industry are doing this, and, and, and um, you know, Chris, where where do you think that might fit in? Yeah. So why don't I jump in uh, first? And um, a lot of times, the products and services that we sell, um, as well as other uh, folks, um, they try to bridge the gap culturally. And one of the first things one of our clients said was, um, I'm in cyber. I had no idea what was happening operationally, but your tool helped me to translate between the two. And the translation was when we were sending some operational alerts about this appears to be misconfigured. Um, there's a bad uh, function call over here. So just some key um, um, indicators that would help force a conversation between like the plant engineer or somebody that knows the SCADA system and the cyber operations. That really helped facilitate an awareness in a culture of learning and adapting 
um, to other um, misinformation that might be on the network. So that's really one of the ones that really helps um, align the charters together so that you can both get benefits from a cyber perspective and operational functionality and efficiencies to be able to uh, bridge the gap for a common mission. And, and Joe, I, I completely agree with you. And, and Josh, I'll tell you, you know, um, I'm going to assume, not knowing how many people are listening to us talk right now, but I'm going to assume that most of them are cut from similar cloths as the three of us, right? We're in the space, industrial control systems, selling to the government, do cyber, um, you know, oh, I want to listen to the PCA talk. I'll try and get on, you know, whatever, right? But I imagine the collective of people that are listening to our voices right now are all, for the most part, kind of shaking their heads like, yep, I heard a lot of this before. Or, you know, there's nothing groundbreaking that we've said on this call right now um, inside of our circles, right? We all agree. We've all said it themselves. Maybe they disagree a little bit. Ah, PCA, he's crazy. I don't, but whatever. Because we live in this space. Oh, there's just something. Oh, he doesn't know this. Yeah, you're probably right. But it's taking this conversation into this into the conferences that like you need to have this talk in an HR conference. Oh, we're going to do a, a 60 minute talk on critical infrastructure with people doing H. Eight. What's critical infrastructure? Never heard of this. What side? Oh, we my computer does that. I had no idea. Right. So even as the PCA, I'm trying to say is as as COVID starts to shake off and we're going to start doing our conferences again. Like uh, at the end of the month, we have the, the Don CIO conference down in Norfolk, and it'll be the CIO community coming in and listen to all the same stuff. How does the CIO of the Navy get 60 minutes at the Air Warfare Conference? Hey, the CIO is going to get up and talk. The PCA is going to come to the Undersea Warfare Conference and give you a 60-minute discussion on what we're doing outside of that. So we try to about building culture. It's about breaking out of this culture. I mean, I, these are great and, and, you know, we're all saying the same things and telling the same sea stories and sort of regurgitating the same talking points, um, which, which is fine. And I think we all it's, it's reinforcing that we're not crazy. So maybe the good part of us talking to each other is it reinforces that we're not nuts. OK, everybody shares this philosophy. I'm going to go off and I'm going to give this rant to somebody else, knowing that I just came from a thing where, wow, the PCA, he believes this way as well. And Microsoft think, great, I'm not crazy. OK, well, now, how do we begin to go outside of our communities and bring this same conversation to those who don't understand what it that? Yeah, this is why I'm going to pay a couple extra bucks to go get some sensor that I need to buy to put on a piece of technology that I depend on that I don't know I even depend on, um, because if that goes away, then I can't do my job. I didn't even know that thing existed. Right. This is, I think, the how we begin to change the culture a little bit. Yeah, and Chris, to your point, um, you know, we can't walk into a power plant or like a chemical factory. There's always a safety minute you, in some of these companies before every meeting that they go into. They say, OK, we take the first two minutes to say, here's kind of our safety um, you know, recommendation for the day. And it's got to be ingrained in the culture like that so that the awareness really starts to be pervasive within the community. Yeah, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal a little bit of thunder from my former boss, Aaron Weiss. He, he actually, I, I like this rant that he goes down. He came from chemical as the CIO at sort of DuPont and chemical manufacturing. You know, and he says uh, his, his line is, you know, um, safety was their sort of right to operate, right? You know, because, you know, at a chemical plant, you turn a couple of valves the wrong way, you kill a town. Historically, that has happened, right? So, uh, you know, that had to be your, your, your mentality, uh, that this is the way we're going to do things. And, you know, I've, I completely agree with them on that. I think that's a great from industry coming into the, uh, the, you know, the military. And I think, you know, this idea of, you know, some of the things that the military then translate onto him is, yeah, that chemical power factory could operate perfectly normal and somebody could drop a jade on it, jade on it and kill just as many people. Right. So that doesn't change your equation either because the enemy gets a vote. If you're within a threat ring and you got to understand that, you know, the enemy could, could keep you from producing what it is you're doing well beyond just because you're operating securely or safely. Um, but he brings a really, really strong talking point into the department, which uh, uh, I, I'd like to see continue to get facilitated or fostered throughout the environment. He's, uh, he's on to something. Hmm. Well, now I, I know you both uh, have, have roles here and, and you, you have stakeholders that you're constantly dealing with and trying to explain why this matters. Um, 
you know, and, and it's interesting as, as you know, we were working a lot with different uh, organizations and it was amazing the difference in terms of how much an organization cared about cybersecurity when it was just NIST and self-reporting and now you have CMMC and third-party assessments. And, uh, you know, it, what's interesting about CMMC is it's not a, it's not a checklist. It, it's a level of maturity that the third party is going to come and assess your processes on, right? So they're coming in. They're not saying, hey, you're compliant with these things, but you're actually doing this level of a program, of a cybersecurity program. So you have the right people. You have the right processes. It's documented. It's demonstrable. And, uh, you know, can't, can't help but wonder if, if that's something that's going to uh, come back on the government side anytime soon. Because, you know, it's, it's been a game changer in terms of uh, with, with, I think, in the div. And you now there, I think some folks are, are complaining about it and, and saying this is onerous and going to be expensive. But, you know, the conversation shifted from the IT director. Maybe, maybe they have a CISO, maybe they have a, a you know, a, a director of security. Uh, but it shifted from from talking with with, with probably IT director and, and and security directors, maybe maybe facility security officer to the president, to the 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 VP for business development, to the because they're afraid of getting that contract. And, and I, I can't help but you know as as we talk through these things and build out the feedback loops, what what you know compliance is is it can be uh, you know a challenge, right? Because it always it. it Policies are always always uh, lagging from 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 the adversary and technology. But where's the stick in all this? We used to we used to joke that you have to get fired. You have to you have to get fired from from command without the band to be able to to for for one of these things to move forward. And I I think we're past that now. But I don't know, Chris, are we? Uh, I don't know if we're completely past it because we haven't seen. You know, folks get fired yet. And uh, it's funny, we were having this conversation earlier today when you, you take different cultures within the Navy and the, uh, um, you know, the engineering culture, that whether it's, uh, you know, commercial engineering plants on a ship or nuclear plants on submarines and aircraft carriers, older destroyers or cruisers we don't have anymore. Um, but if you failed an inspection, you know, as a commanding officer, an engineering inspection in surf, you could get relieved, right? I mean, that was a big deal. Um and, and not every information system on a ship is something that, that, that a commander has control over, right? There's some provided him. So it's not everything he, he can be held or he or she can be held responsible for. But the ones that he can, he or she can be held responsible for, I mean, there's got to be some level of accountability if you're taking this stuff seriously or not. And you just can't be ignorant of its capabilities and what it's designed to go do. So that's coming, right? The, the, the Chief Naval Operations instituted a uh, commander, commander cyber dashboard. Um, to give commanders a certain visibility into things that they might not have always been aware of, right? So, yeah, and it wasn't easy to be aware of those things. So let's make it a little bit easier for you. We'll put it in a format you can click and kind of get a one-stop snapshot. Part. One stop, stop, one, you know what I'm trying to say, <laughs> one-stop shop uh, of, you know, where my systems are in their ATO cycles. If Are there things coming up that for reinspections? Do, you know, you know, am I am I up keeping up to date with whatever the systems that I have control over from you know pants you know scan patch scan that that thing? You know, am I just doing the the basic you know blocking and tackling um, and giving it the attention it deserves? That is coming uh, again. CNO acknowledged that we weren't necessarily setting commanders up to be successful because it was hard to get your hands around all of those things. So they created this dashboard. I think that's a really uh, positive uh, 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 step that the CNO took. Marine Corps has very similar processes that they're taking on board. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I, I hate to say it comes back to, um, to accountability and, you know, at some points, I'd say made an example of that's not, that's the wrong way. Or you encourage people and reward people. They're doing good jobs. You go to the other stage. Right. So I'm not just going to, I'm not going to shoot people for not the trains running on time. I'm going to reward people that make the trains run on time. And maybe they'll take the, the head nod that, Hey, if I make the trains run on time too, I'll also get rewarded. Um, but that's again, it, it takes time, and there's people that are still pushing back on some of the, uh, the dependencies that we have in cyber and what they should or should not be held accountable for. So, Chris, I, I think you mentioned, you know, uh, probably uh, we're, we're part of our audience, is probably most of our audience is, is probably part of the choir, right? Uh, a lot of folks, a lot of experience, probably uh, looking to f figure out what, how they can help, right? How what. Uh, you know, where should they be talking to? Which contracts should they really be looking at? 
you know, it's interesting uh, when, when you watch just the RFPs and, and what comes out. Uh, you know, it's challenging because either it's it's maybe buried in a, in a OTA somewhere, or or maybe it's it's uh, sandwiched in uh, you know a large enterprise or IDIQ. Um, you know, there's a lot here for us to innovate through, right, and get through these iterations. And I think we're we're learning in the commercial spaces, we're learning in, the, in government spaces. Where, where do the good ideas go to? So that's a tough one, right? I mean, you, you, we have our one of the things when it comes to, to innovating, and, and I, I kind of throw a spear at the at the Department of Defense in this is you'll have a good technology that has some really whiz bang idea, and they'll bring it forward and they'll say, well, we don't have a requirement for this. Well, of course you didn't, because it had to be invented. You didn't know about it. How could you have a requirement for it? And then right. and then what happens is it says, oh, we'll go generate a requirement for it, and we'll get it through the act. You know. And by the time it comes out the other end as a legitimate requirement, that technology is obsolete, right? I mean, we, we have to do better. And I know uh, Miss Lords, who was at, who was ANS um, at the OSD level, uh, was pushing aggressively. This is the former administration, but pushing aggressively for, you know, we have to have different ways to acquire software. We can't just wait for the acquisition process, palming cycle. You know, not only would it take two weeks, two years to justify the requirement, and then take another three years to palm for it, right? And we get the money in place to buy it. I mean, there has to be a way that we that we speed through this, particularly when it comes to, um, you know, as the as the, the PCA is for, is focusing on more of the war fighting applications associated with this. There hasn't been as much attention given to that. And the attention that it has been given is sort of lives in the sap stow. We're going to whisper about it in dark corners, intelligence community, MIP funding. Well, 10 years ago, I would have agreed with that. Um, the idea that offensive cyber operations is a means and method of warfare is no longer a secret, right? We talk about it openly. We have the National Mission Force. The Mission Force has teams that do offensive cyber per their mission statement. It would lead to natural conclusion that people would be trying to acquire offensive cyber tools to go support offensive cyber missions. You know, um, the last I looked, the Joint Strike Fighter does not deliver picnic baskets, right? It is not a humanitarian aid delivery via delivery system. Um, it does a lot of things that enables warfighting, not of them all the delivering of kinetic effects, but it, again, not a humanitarian aid platform. So why is it that we still whisper about what we're going to do in cyber and the fact that we're not going to weaponize it? Pandora's box has been opened. We are in the space of weaponizing cyber, right, wrong, or indifferent. Um, it's where we're at. And, you know, our adversaries are embracing it aggressively. Um, we need to be moving into that. So I would say... Certain people in industry, uh, you know, if you're going to come talk to me, I'm very interested in warfighting. So those are things that I would like to hear about. Well, I think we're, we're coming up on our time. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think to, that, that, that subsequent, you know, point there, we have to, the Pandora's box is open and we have to fight through. Right. Uh, you know, Joe, Chris, I really want to appreciate that. And thank you for your time today. Uh, you know, I, I, I think this has been a valuable conversation, uh, you know, you've taken from one in, in, the, in the course here, uh, you know, uh, and I want to end it just on, on a quick, uh, you know, we, I think we got a, a minute left here for each of you. So, um, you know, Joe, if you want to, what's that one thing that we should have talked about? And, and then, Chris, if you want to bring us home and, and we'll call it a day. Yeah, so Chris, just to piggyback on your last point is the bar is so low for cost of entry for anybody to do cyber attacks or things like that. There's cloud computing, you can spin up resources, things like that. So my only last bullet would be make sure you have your cyber defense program at least outlined for what you want to do and the key points that are most critical for you because zero trust is really a good formula to assume a, a breach within your environment. So detect it early, and I'll leave it with that. So it sounds like there's some easier and quicker things to get going. Yeah, and and, and, and to close it out, I would say, you know, not to say that security is unimportant. Remember, right, that's table stakes now. That is that is entry level table stakes. It is, it is part of every conversation, um, and we are aggressively pursuing zero trust uh, and with Microsoft, with, uh, you know, our Office 365 deployments, um, the folks on the you know traditional enterprise IT side has done a masterful job of working with U.S. Cybercom and Microsoft to get us to a zero trust environment. Um, that is absolutely happening. Uh, so don't read it because I don't. You know, it, 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 the CIO was sitting right next to me. 
I'd be letting him really lead the security side of this conversation because the majority of the capability and acquisition of traditional security tools and the way we're going to do 360, we're going to do zero trust and, you know, identity management is, is really a CIO function. I endorse and support in every way that I can. Um, and then, you know, take that brackish water where we both live in that is security and then start moving towards war fighting. Again, we're a military, right? So at the end of the day, it's a war fighting function. We're here to deliver, you know, a kinetic and non-kinetic effects in the defeat of our adversaries, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, you know, that's that's this new thing that the PCA is entering. But, uh, you know, working with industry is critically important. You're the ones that are going to provide us the capability. We don't do anything. You know, we don't make anything our own. We get it from industry. So it's those relationships with industry that have to be strengthened to ensure that we have what we need to do our job. Well, I, you know, I, I think that from a maturity perspective, that's huge, that we're, we're moving to where cyber defense isn't just an IT conversation. Well, gentlemen, thank you for your time today. I think this has been a fantastic conversation and uh, appreciate and, and look forward to, to where this all goes. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Joe. Cheers.